Well, good evening and welcome to each of you. 17 will be where we start tonight. Number 17. Twenty-seven. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
number 66 is our next song together. 66, and if you're able, we invite you to stand while we sing. <clears throat> this time, like to ask Brother C.J. Dining, or if he'll lead us, please. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be here in your house and to hear your word. We pray, Lord, that we may come to you with open hearts and ready minds, that we may be focused and attentive on what you would have us to learn here, that we may think upon these things, Father, that we may live the life that you wish us to live, the life that we may not be ashamed of when we meet you. Please help us to be ready to, to meet you, Father, to keep our life in the right perspective, to not be distracted or led astray or fooled, but we pray, Lord, that we may uh, stand upon your wisdom. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we say good evening to each of you. I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but uh, I'm just trying to start a new thing here. Instead of... Old Spice, it's slice and dice, but I believe I've got the matter sewed up, so I think we'll be all right. Well, we have a fellowship meeting Friday planned at 7 o'clock for games and snacks. If any of that appeals to you, I'm sure you've got a, some bone that that'll scratch. Saturday is our men's meeting here at the church at 7.30. And then, of course, always pray for the upcoming Lord's Day ministries and uh, be a people of prayer. These are days that call for prayer in every turn, it seems like. And uh, I was just thinking about prayer that we need to ask the Lord questions about ourselves as well as make requests of him. It needs to be a two-way conversation. I want to pray for other churches. I'm sure other churches are experiencing the same trials and tribulations that go on in other places as well as here. Always keep our challenge members in your prayer. Um, because of time and circumstance, we have several that need to be always remembered in our prayers. And then we live in a world that's hard to describe. I hope that you take <clears throat> slow about latching on to everything you hear. Um, because if you latch on to everything you hear, you're going to run into yourself coming and going. And so just um, have an ear, but keep your mind and heart open to God, and don't be too quick to jump on anything. But uh, be a people of prayer about uh, the way things are and the way we need to be in these times. We're going to begin tonight in Matthew chapter 8, if you'd like to open your Bible. Matthew chapter 8, and we'll start reading in the 28th verse. It's an interesting read, but in Matthew 8 and verse 28, it says, When he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, 
exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. I think um, there are many times that you read in the scripture of people that are being driven, moved, or even possessed by an evil spirit. And we sort of have forgotten that those things exist. But when you see some of the things that go on today and the people's behavior and their state of mind and the things they do, I think it's still with us. But moving on in our reading in verse 29. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, our Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the herd the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. Behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. I want to also go over to the ninth chapter of Matthew. And we'll pick up reading in verse 36. Matthew 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's our subject tonight, spiritual concerns. We're not going to talk about the swine that ran down the steep slope and perished, but there is a point we will draw from that in just a moment. As you see the compassion of Christ at this point, as well as his entire ministry, his love to save sinners never did dwindle, it never did die off. So um, just uh, a thought, uh, kind of provoke our thinking. Uh, maybe you've been in a crowd of people at some event, and I know I was at one recently, and there was a lot of people there. I mean, it wasn't that anybody was gonna win a million dollars or anything, but it was an event. <coughs> that people had interest in humanly speaking. So they came out and there was a lot of, of people there. But you would, and some thoughts I had is, you wonder what would happen if that same group was there. Somebody picked up a microphone and started preaching the fact that you must repent and be born again. What would happen to the crowd? How many people would stay for that? And then, have you ever had a thought about what if all these people were saved? What if all these people were right with God? What if everything was on the right level it needs to be with the Lord? That would be a good thought. That would be a wonderful thing to entertain. Well, <clears throat> whatever it may be, I think we need to follow the lead of Christ when it comes to our ministry to other people. For example, we read back in Matthew chapter 8, and there in verse 34, that behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. So think about that one just a bit. Well, if you were out trying to talk to someone about the Lord, and you had visited a few houses, and suddenly, all of the people of the town was to tell you, get out. Get out. We don't want to hear what you've got to say. You know, that would be a pretty hard thing to overcome. Um, that might stop us. You know, that might say, well, okay. I want to read about Jeremiah chapter 20. And uh, this is the human side we have to deal with. Jeremiah chapter 20, and there we'll begin reading in verse 7. 
O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily, every one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. So there was the response upon the individual because all he was getting was just people beating him back as he would uh, tell them and warn them of the coming judgments of God. But you notice the latter part of that verse says, His word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. So there's the spiritual man. You see both the fleshly man and you see the spiritual man. Humanly speaking, the reproach that was leveled against Jeremiah was more than he could withstand. And don't ever think that you won't run up against something that'll knock you over. That's a little more than you were prepared to take head on. But in his communing, communing with God's word, that made a stalwart Christian soldier out of him because he said his word would not quit burning and he said I had I had to speak I had to to proclaim what God wanted me to say over in 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 and here in verse 6 2nd Corinthians 4 6 for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There's nothing any more wonderful than being able to convey the message of God's salvation to another person. But look at verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So because we have this treasure in earthen vessels... We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are all we delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Look down to verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Somebody says, well, I don't see <clears throat> what the problem is. Uh, you know, you go out and you talk to a person about the Lord, and what's the problem? Well, if a person is at that point in their thinking, it's because they haven't gone out. They really haven't tried uh, to reach lost people and got into the nitty-gritty of it to where uh, things began to go back and forth. So serving in behalf of others is an experience that can only be sustained by God. It is not an advanced supply of invincible strength and courage that we just would have dumped on us before we would go out. In um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and there in verse um, 17, Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, he's not talking about he went to the zoo and stuck his head through the bars and a lion was there. He's talking about the tremendous devouring force that there is to stop you in the work of God. That it's just like being devoured. And he said, God delivered me out of that. So in the 18th verse, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. It's not that we don't know that there is difficulty in being a witness for the Lord, 
But it's not that we don't know that the Lord will deliver us. It's that we find our flesh reluctant to do it over again. You know, when you've had your head in the mouth of a lion, even though you got delivered, you might be reluctant to do it again. So that's sometimes a person has an experience, and that experience sort of goes on the negative as far as whether they want to do it again or not. In Luke chapter 9, in Luke chapter 9, in verse 23 and 24, these are just basic things about the forwarding of God's work through ourselves. In Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. All right, nothing is done for the Lord by just um, staying within a comfort zone. Um, that won't work. You know, that'll just keep us neutralized entirely. The better efforts that are made in God's work are made when it seems to be something most inconvenient and uncomfortable, but we're doing it anyway by faith. You know why the best advancements are made at that point? Because we're being sustained by God in doing it. And we're there because of our faith and his support. In the 12th chapter of John, in the 12th chapter of John, and there in the 23rd verse, John 12, 23, Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And we all understand the germination process and then how that a plant comes out of the seed once it germinates. <coughs> he that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. We cannot make our service to God just about self-preservation, and that is when it's convenient for us. And uh, that would be putting our interests first. We cannot do that. It has to be about determination to understand what needs to be done. And how many things are there in life that way? You can't just put them on a convenience basis that, okay, if I have nothing else to do, and if I feel like it, and if everything is just good, I'll do it. There are so many things in life you cannot put on that basis. It has to be, this has got to be done, and I've got to do it. So that's what Christ is talking about here, and he's using the illustration of planting seed. We're in that season now when I see farmers are beginning to work up their fields, and that's so they can put the seed in there. But the example that Christ gave us is one we can understand. When it comes to planting seed, it's first of all when the season has arrived and uh, when the opportunity is there. And it's about when the ground is ready and the weather permits. It is not about just when we get a feeling <clears throat> that we want to do it. You know, I'm persuaded that many, many <clears throat> farmers, when it comes to putting their crops out, they really have to push themselves. I mean, they might not uh, be feeling too well. Maybe they're dealing with some health issues um, and other things, maybe age. And it's not, I feel like doing this. It's got to be done. Now's the time to do it. And so... The urge to do that comes from the sense of urgency that it has to be done. So that's where all things that are done with strength, that's how it originates. Not on a convenience basis, but it has to be done. And I've got to do it. 
The reward for planting this seed comes at harvest time. So when we think about the illustration Christ gave us, you can see that there is a realization of the need of it, and the realization of the need is what gives you the, uh, the effort to go forward, but the reward will be at harvest time. And of course, that's when God gives us a reward for service. So when you're sowing correctly, you have hope in your sowing process. I've never ran across a farmer that was successful in farming and had the right attitude about it that actually thought of sowing as being an undue, um, inappropriate burden that was placed on him. I've never seen a farmer that felt that way. It's always, yeah, it's hard work, but this is my opportunity, and I've got to do it. So when we get into the correct frame of mind, we're not going to think that serving God in the capacity of trying to reach others is something undue burden that has been somehow shoved off upon us. No one buys seed just to let it sit on the shelf. You buy it because you want to produce a harvest. So it's all about, when you think about the cost of seed and fertilizer, and I would even hate to uh, try to figure that up now, the way things are going skyrocketing, but a farmer looks at it this way. Yeah, boy, it's high. It's really high, but I have to make this as an investment. It's an investment, and I will get my money back plus what the harvest will bring. So you discount the cost of putting a crop out based on the fact of what the harvest will bring. And so whatever the inconveniences that are involved in us going forth for the Lord, when we get it right in here and here, we're going to just say, well, it's just an investment. It is, uh, it is not really an expense that I'll have to bear on my own. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and there in verse 15. I think this gives us a pretty good idea of what we're talking about. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So what was his motivation? Their need and that he had something that he could contribute to that need. It wasn't about whether they liked him or not and about whether they were going to uh, give him some praise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, you think about the riches of heaven, you think about the comforts of heaven he had with the Father, Yet for, and let's take the R off of the your and say you, for you. For your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So think of that mind. In uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Christ never regretted it and does not today. Well, let's go back to Exodus chapter 4 for a moment. And I think these are all good things to kind of gauge yourself. Uh, like I mentioned in a prayer request, ask God some questions about ourselves. So how close are we to having the mind that will produce what is necessary to reach out to others? When God called Moses on one of the most important missions the world has ever known, to go down to Egypt and lead the Israelite people out of Egypt, you find in verse 10, Moses replying back to God, O Lord, uh, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb or deaf are the seeing or the blind have not I the Lord 
Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Then in verse 12, Lord, you better send somebody else. O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. And he shall be, excuse me, thy spokesman unto the people. He shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And Moses went. All right, what, was, what formed his state of mind about going? He had to get over making it a matter of his person unto making it a matter of obedience. And that is a big jump. You know, too many times, well, I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know how to do it. Well, God says, do it. So we've got to get our person out of the picture and get obedience as the reason. We're no match for the Pharaohs in, out in our world any more than Moses was, but the witness of God's word. God said, I will give you the word. So the witness of God's word, that can never be overthrown by any power. So where do we start? Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter 9 again. Matthew chapter 9, and there in verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. When was the last time we prayed that? Before we came to church, maybe. Um, sometime during the week, we began to pray. Lord, I want you to send somebody to talk to my neighbors about the Lord. I want you to send somebody to talk to um, some relative of mine, somebody I know. And Lord, I want you to send somebody. When was the last time we prayed that? All right, there's where it's got to begin. It's got to be a wellspring from within us. It has to be generated by personal surrender to be used of the Lord through, seek, through prayer that's seeking. I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 6, and this, I think, gives us the completeness of that prayer. In Isaiah chapter 6, and so if we say, Lord, someone, someone has got to go, and so here in verse 8 of Isaiah 6, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who is that someone? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Have you ever thought about that? You might be praying for God to send somebody. All right, who's he going to send? You. He's going to send you. So what happened to Isaiah? Back in chapter 6 and verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. He had been jarred out of his comfort zone. Uzziah had been a very able and uh, loyal servant to God up to the point to where when he got big in his own mind, he became proud. And so Isaiah was kind of you know, comfortable living in a nation that had a good, strong Christian king. And all of a sudden, Isaiah gets in trouble with God. He's smitten with leprosy, and he dies. And boy, that really jarred Isaiah. He got out of his comfort zone. And so this thing then developed um, as he uh, had concerns beyond himself to where it was, here am I, send me, send me. Well, let's just uh, create a little scenario in our mind, if we will. And uh, I'm going to make you a dual person uh, for this illustration. Make you the lost person, and then make you the saved person. 
So you be both of them. And so let's, first of all, say you're the lost person. You live in a certain house on a certain street in a certain town. And there's also you, the saved person, which um, kind of get us in our thinking about all this. You live just down the street a ways. So um, uh, try to make yourself both persons. Then ask yourself the question, would I be the needed witness to reach out to me? Would I be the person that would be able to reach out to me if I was lost? What I am now as a Christian, what I'm doing now as a Christian, what I'm praying now as a Christian, what I'm focused on now as a Christian, would I reach me if I was lost? I think we need to think that way. We need to try to put ourselves in that uh, thought process to kind of get where we're at uh, in our uh, service unto the Lord. And of course, we always have to remember the second great command. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we have to think that way. If I was a lost person, and then I as a saved person, would I really reach that me lost person? Or would it just be I drive by their house every day? I think, yeah, oh, wow, look at them. I look at the life they live. Have you ever thought about what you would be if you were not saved? Have you ever stopped to think where your life would be right now if you had never been saved? Well, you might do that a little bit before you look down on a lost person whose life is not what you think that it ought to be. And so we have to make that connection. Now over in John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, and here in verse 44 and 45, in John 6, 44 and 45, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now, going to the end of that chapter, or toward the end of the chapter, in verse 65, he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now, this is not Calvinism. This is not saying that, <clears throat> you know, the person just got all of a sudden have lightning strike them from heaven and then they're saved. Not saying that at all. But what it's uh, showing us, Jesus did not base his thoughts about his ministry on the results of people's responses. Because you notice in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. If Christ would have based his ministry on people's responses, I mean, he wouldn't have had anything to base it on, really. It would have been a very weak foundation. But he based it on something much deeper. And that's what you see in verse 65. No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. What's that talking about? It's talking about... A ministry is just a means that God uses to deliver his word. And his word is what God uses to draw the people. So it's not a matter of the minister and the response that the minister gets or that you will get if you talk to people. It's a matter of getting the word out there for God to use his word to draw people. It's got to be on that level. So Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says that God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. 1 Peter 1.23 says it's the incorruptible seed that is planted within the heart of a person. And <clears throat> going over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and this is how we have to think about this. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient. 
in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, so here it is again, except God draw the person, you can't come to me. So it's on a deeper level than just a person who is talking to the person is to get the word of God into their heart for God to use to draw that person that God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You see, it takes the word of God being sown into the heart. Now, it's so, po uh, it's so possible to get so concerned about how did the visit go that we might not really think about what did I leave them for God to work with. It's not us. It's what did we give them for God to work with. I don't want this to sound negative at all, but inviting people to church is a good thing. I mean, that really is a necessary thing. But you have to keep in mind, if you who have the truth invite a person to come to church, and that's all you do, somebody who has a false doctrine can invite them to come to their church too. See, that's, that's not it, is it? it has got to be something different than that. And so, in many cases, a person will not come to a New Testament church just on an invitation. Why? It's not the popular place. A New Testament church is not the popular place. It'll be someplace else is, is the popular place. So what are you going to do then? You have to give something to them for God to work with. That's what our witness is about. It's planting the seed of God's word. And you have to dodge a lot. Uh, God says you can't strive. And you'll find out that a lot of times people put up a smoke screen and they put up an opposition. I know there's a, a man, if I was to tell his name, a lot of you know him. And I talked to him for a good time and he was just throwing things out, throwing things out to see what my reaction would be. And after he, we got through, he said, well, I didn't really believe those things. I just wanted to see what you believe. So you have to kind of, you know, have some consideration that it's about sowing the good seed. It's not about you. It's not about an argument, but it's being able to get the seed sown. In John chapter 20, in John chapter 20, and verse 21, John 20, 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. All right, are you the you? If you're saved, you are the you. I am the you. So as God sent Christ, he's also sent us to carry on the work that Christ started. So this was a matter of accepting the Lordship of Christ, first of all. Secondly, it's a matter of a responsibility that's committed. And he said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. So what if they would have just gone home and that had been the end of it? It wouldn't have happened, would it? They wouldn't have been sent as the Father had sent him. But I want you to notice also in verse 23, this is a verse that the Catholics get a lot of traction from. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So the Pope or the priest gets in his little box and the people get on the other side in a little hole in the wall and so there's confession time and the priest says, I forgive your sins. That's not it. That's not it. What this is talking about, our ministry, is about settling people's eternal destiny. That's what it's about. And if we don't tell them about the salvation of the Lord, their sins will never be forgiven. If we tell them and they don't accept, then that's on them. That's what you have there. 
the ministry of witnessing is all important. So can we stand by and not do this? Can we do that? In Psalm chapter 142 and verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, and there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I believe that there could be people in hell right now saying that. Nobody cared for me. Nobody ever tried. And there might be people right now, if their soul was to speak, they're still alive, and they know Christians, but they could say, well, there's not a one of them cared for my soul. There's not a one of them even thought about my soul. Well, let no man despise thee. That's what Titus chapter 2 and verse 15 says. So I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. This is, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. Well, well, preacher, I don't know what to say. What shall I say? There was a man that the Lord had cast a demon out of him in Mark chapter 5. And he just wanted to sit at Jesus' feet. You know, that's a good place to be. But the Lord told him, he said, you go home to your friends and you tell them what God has done for you. That's where you start. If you don't have a lot of things that you can work with in a conversation, tell the person how you got saved. And God can use that as a testimony to them. May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, as we come to you tonight, we know that this is the heart of your work, and this is what we all need to be stepping up to do, because the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few, and you've told us to pray ourselves for laborers. So we just ask that you'll help us in this, because it's so easy to get in our comfort zone. We're saved and we enjoy the things of God. We look forward to the promises of God. But the other people around us, you know, they ought to be saved, but they're not. But we know that it's our responsibility to be a witness unto them and in whatever way we can. And we know you will bless every effort that's put forth for you. So we ask you to give the invitation for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand as we